welcome. Welcome, everyone. Oh, we've got a great good life. We're both excited about this program, aren't we, sweet? That's right. Well, I said we got a great good life. Yes, we do. And that's you and I. <laughs> well, we do too, don't we? That's right. And yes, Dr. Kenan Bridges. Kenan Bridges is with us, and what a delightful person. You're going to be blessed today. He's from the Grace and Peace Global Fellowship in Tampa, Florida. And we're going to talk about unmasking the accuser. That's right. You're going to learn a lot today. If you know anyone that's hurt, that is really struggling with unforgiveness, maybe it's you. We're going to really uncover a lot today. It's a great book. It's going to be a great interview. Stay tuned. Amen. And our music, Canaan's voice, is going to be singing. Yes. And we're, we've got so many good things in store for you today. And we'll tell you about them in a minute. Here's Canaan's voice. you give me breath I walk because you are my steps I sing because you are the melody and I am cause you say that I am could it be that you're the reason I live the reason I love the reason I always have enough you're the reason I lie the reason I smile Standing all the while, you're the reason for everything I do. Everything I do. Oh, Lord, it's true. Yes, it's true. All my reasons are you. Oh, yeah. Mm, Lord, you are the meaning of it all. You speak and make the nations fall. You dance and all creation moves in place. You are faith, you are hope, you are light, you are grace. And you're the reason I live, the reason I love, the reason I always have enough. You're the reason I laugh, the reason I smile, the reason I'm standing all the while. You're the reason for Yeah. 
you, Kane and the Voice. Well, what a joy it is to have Dr. Keenan Bridges with us yeah. today. He is a blessing just to talk with him. He'll lift your spirits. And today, True. if you're walking in some kind of slander or somebody slandering you, you need to listen to this program. Yeah. We're going to be talking about unmasking the enemy. And that's just what we're going to do. Amen. And then what to do about it. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yeah, awesome. One thing just to unmask him, but then what do you do about it? Yeah. Awesome. And that's what you're going to tell us. Today. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Good to be here again. So Bless you. you. Good to be here Bless again. You. Awesome. Awesome. Well, you know what? I was, we talked about this in the green room. It's too bad you guys couldn't be in the, <laughs> in the green room. <laughs> we almost had right. church back there. That's right. It's wonderful. But you shared something in the green room I want you to share. I told you I was going to ask you why you even wrote the book. Mm. And you shared because of some past hurts. But you saw a vision, too, God gave you. And people need to know about this vision and know yes. how the enemy operates. So the Lord gave me this vision of uh, accusation. And I saw two Christians coming out of a church and they were just having a casual conversation, talking. And as I looked, I zeroed in on them, I could see these imps or these little miniature demons on each of their shoulders. And these demons were whispering things into their ears. And, and then, the, then there was a shift in this sort of vision and it became graphic in the sense that the demons vomited on the other person. So each of the demons vomits, and now both of the Christians are covered in this, this sort of slime. That's the best way to describe it. And I asked the Lord, I said, what is that? He says, that's slander and offense. Hmm. And I said, oh my goodness. So now I have a physical sort of perspective of what this looks like. You know, if you could, if you could pull back the veil of reality and see into the spiritual realm, that's what it looks like. That's what... This, this stuff is, is, is slime. It's something that comes from the pit of darkness, and it's infecting a lot of believers. You know? And they can't even see it. They can't see it. You know, and that, I think that's what makes it so dangerous is that they can't see it. Right. Yeah. I, I just want to stop for a moment. Now, some of you have been slandered, and in return, you've slandered somebody else. Now, we want you to really listen to this program today. Keenan has got a real jump on the subject of slander and whatever else you do to your fellow man in church. Now, if you're not in church, you still need to listen. That's right. Because... Somebody is going to slander you. Someone's going to talk about you. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have to find out just what to do. Yeah. Keenan, tell us. Yeah. Well, when does this start? I love that in the green room. When does it start in life when well, you're young? <laughs> when you're a child. You know, um, it started for me when I was a child. You know, even being on the playground and someone says something to you that's hurtful. Or the first, actually, this is an interesting story. When I was a kid, I remember a friend of mine who was my best friend. And something happened, there was some sort of quarrel, and I found out that he did something behind my back. And I felt this deep sense of betrayal and rejection. And what happened was the enemy used that situation to try to tell me that, you, you know, you can't trust anybody. You can't even trust your own best friend. They're going to talk about you behind your back. They're going to, you know, slander you. And these seeds are rolling in our, in our heart. Well, will start in our head, and then they sink down into our heart. And um, throughout my life, I can point to different instances where there was a situation of either betrayal, hurt, or offense. And really, for a lot of people, it begins in the womb. It doesn't even, you know, the enemy doesn't wait till you're born. He, 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 he attacks your mother while you're in the womb, and then he attacks you when you're born. And um, these are the seeds that are planted. And that's why when we get older and we're facing these situations, 
is, is difficult for us because these things have been built up over years and years and years and years. But, you know, here's the beauty of it. If you've been slandered, if you've been gossiped about, you're in good company. Nobody's exempt because even God was slandered. He was slandered in the Garden of Eden when Satan came to Eve and contradicted everything that God told her. She said, you know, God said we can eat of every tree except this one. And he says, well, you're not going to die if you eat that one, even though he says that. And immediately he tried to bring God's character into question. That's what slander is all about. It's a damaging statement that affects someone's character or their reputation. In other words, the way people see them. Now watch this. It, it affects the way you perceive a person. In other words, what comes up in your mind when their name is mentioned. That's right. It's true. See, that, that's what it's all about. You know, the enemy wants our name to be defiled. He wants our reputation to be tarnished so that when that name is mentioned, a negative view comes up. That's why many people, you mention the church, oh, here we go again, the church. <laughs> because that, that, that church or that concept has a negative view in that person's mind. And that's why slander is so destructive and so powerful. Yeah. Whether you're in church or you're out of church, it's still the same thing. That's right. You still got that slander and uh, you've got to learn how to defeat it. And we're going to learn that today. Yes, we are. And love is the way, isn't it? That's right. Well, Amen. you, um, <laughs> I just want to read this. I kind of got tickled. You <laughs> said, um, you asked a group of people, do you work for the devil? That's right. What did you mean by that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I remember asking the, the group that, and, and uh, people are kind of shocked when you ask that question. What are you trying to say? You know, I work for the devil. But this is, this is how we have to look at this. The Bible says this. It says, he that hates his brother is a murderer. That's right. Is a murderer. That word literally means assassin. Now, what's an assassin? An assassin is someone who kills on contract. In other words, they, they, they work for someone else. They're hired to kill someone. Now, watch this. The Bible says that Satan was a murderer from the beginning. And when Jesus was talking to the religious Pharisees and hypocrites, he says, you do the lust of your father. You, you're, doing, you're just doing what your father has told you to do. And many Christians don't understand. Now watch this. They don't recognize that when you use your mouth, your influence, when you use your ability to communicate in order to destroy someone else's reputation or to hurt someone else's character, you are working for Satan. That's You're right. not working yeah. for God. You're yeah, working for right. the enemy. And unfortunately, many people don't know that, see, Satan moved out of the church a long time ago. You know, he used to work and kill and do all this stuff, but he didn't have to do that because Christians kill each other. He simply hires people in the church to do his dirty work. Now, how does he hire us? He hires us when we're hurt. You see, when we're hurt, we willingly submit our emotions. We willingly submit our pain to the enemy to manipulate, and he ends up using that pain to cause us to bring hurt and chaos into someone else's life. And this is why people need to understand. And I believe, I believe today God wants to fire some people. I want to fire you today, uh, not from your job, but from whatever contract the enemy has tried to use through your pain, your hurt, your bitterness, to use you as a vessel unknowingly. You didn't mean any harm but to unknowingly use you as a vessel to bring pain and destruction to the body of Christ. In the words of our president-elect, you're fired. So I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> well, you know what? I know Bob wants to hold that book up, but I love the format of this book. Mm -hmm. And it's great for small groups. If yeah. you have a small group, oh, wow. For one thing, you know, a lot of people are busy. They don't have time to read 50 pages and then go meet with their group. But it's, That's right. I've, I counted. Most of these chapters are only about 10 pages. And at the end of the chapter, there are three discussion questions. That's right. And also a prayer. That's right. So I just thought, wow. So if you're dealing, whatever you're dealing with, and you cover so much in this book, yeah, yeah, you yeah. just about 
And the thing is, we can all benefit from yeah, this. Yeah, I think so. We've all been hurt. We've all said things we wish we had not said. We wish we could retract. We said it out of hurt. That's right. We said it to get back because we were hurt. That's right. So, wow, this is a wonderful book. And here's something else. What? We just learned that there are a hundred of these books that Kenan's going to give to us. And a hundred of them will go to a hundred of you. Mm. And you will prize this book. Absolutely. If you read it, you will prize it. Yes. And that's all you have to do is write to the Christian Television Network and say you want one of the books. When we go over a hundred, you're out of luck. <laughs> <laughs> so get to the phones or write and tell us you want this book, Unmasking the Accuser. Mm. And you've been yeah. trying to do that for a long time. Mm. Unmask the Accuser. Mm. And you don't know exactly what he looks like. You don't know exactly what he does. But this will tell you yeah. mm. what he's yeah. doing. That's right. Awesome. You know, I think uh, one of the things that I really want to bring out is for people to understand the nature of the accuser. You see, once you know the nature of the accuser, who the accuser is. Now, one of the words for devil in our King James Version Bible is the word diabolos, and it means slanderer. You know, the Bible refers to Satan in the book of Revelation as the accuser of the brethren. He's the one who is accusing us before God day and night, and he is the one that is responsible for trying to make us accuse each other. And this thing of accusation is very serious. When I travel all over the world, people all over the world, no matter their ethnicity, their dialect, their culture, are battling with this. In other words, Satan is throwing rocks and he's hiding his hand. And so while he is railing accusations against God's church, and we're railing accusations against each other, he's sitting back and reaping the spoils of the chaos. You see, Jesus said, a house divided cannot stand. And I want you to understand, one of the reasons why I wrote this book is because the Lord showed me this analogy. If you think about a disease, an infection, for example, one of the, one of the most common infections on college campuses is, is meningitis, bacterial meningitis, viral, viral meningitis. But bacterial meningitis can be transmitted from someone's mouth and they don't know they have it. Mm. So you can give it to somebody else and not know you even have it. Now watch this. One, once you transmit that bacterial meningitis, it has the potential to go past the blood-brain bar barrier and infect the brain. Now watch this. This is what's happening. People are being infected with offense in the church. And what's happening is that Satan is using slander and gossip to transmit the infection. And once he does it, once offense goes, it goes past the mind barrier and gets into the thought life. And once it gets into the thought life, it sinks down into the heart life. And the Bible says, guard the heart with all diligence because out of it are the issues of life. Yeah. Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks which means that if someone is gossiping, their heart's already infected. Amen. By the time we, we say things, the hurt has already sank down. Now, I want, I want people to understand this too, that a lot of people say, well, I don't really deal with this. This is not for me. Wrong. <laughs> it's for everybody. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is one of the most common situations in the church today. Amen. And um, it's affecting people's health. It's affecting people's peace of mind. It's affecting their ability to know their calling. There are people all over the world that don't know what God's called them to do because they're in a stagnant place. And what got them in that stagnant place was hurt and disappointment. Maybe you went to a church and you were not accepted the way you wanted to be. Or maybe you went to, you know, you're on your job, you weren't accepted the way you wanted to be. Maybe someone said something that offended you. All of these things affect the condition of a heart. And so we have to understand that. Amen. Don't take it in. That's right. You reject Sorry. anything like that. That's right. We're coming back and we're going to talk about 
some other great things and that's going to help you tremendously after music by Canaan's voice. There are so many different ways to watch the CTN family of networks. We're available on television almost anywhere. Direct TV, Dish Network, Glory Star. We even have a CTN Roku channel. If you live near any of these cities, you can watch us with an indoor outdoor antenna or through your local cable company. Best of all, you can watch CTN anywhere at any time by going to the internet. We're streaming online. Watch your desktop, laptop, tablet, iPad, your phone, or even your watch. Most of our shows are also available on demand. Watch what you want, when you want at ctnonline.com. CTN's family of networks. Take us with you and watch wherever you go. He's been right there beside 
Thank you, Canaan's voice. Yes. This is the book we're talking about, but we're talking about even more than this book. But there is a hundred of them waiting for the first people to call in. I'm not saying you have to send any money or anything like that. You might even open the book and find a dollar in it. <laughs> so, now, wait a minute. <laughs> and you may open the book and find a fortune in it. Mm. Well, the truth because is. there is a fortune That's right. in that book. Yeah, that's good. Wow. Well, we're going to talk about the tongue. Yeah. You know, the Bible says life and death is in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat its fruit. So our, our tongue is a seed sower. And what comes out of our tongue produces fruit. Now, see, if people understood that your tongue is either a creative force or a destructive force, it can either create or it can destroy. James says the tongue is an unruly beast, yeah. you know, <laughs> in it is a world of iniquity. And so um, how many of us has our tongue gotten us into trouble? And but your tongue can get you out of trouble. <laughs> you know, it just <laughs> depends on how it's used. But I, I want people to understand something before we go further, and that is when we look at this issue of gossip, for example, people don't think it's a serious sin. They say, oh, that's not, that's not a big sin. You know, they're, they're, that's not one of the big five, <laughs> so I'm good, you know. But, but let's go to the Bible. The Bible says in the book of Exodus, the book of uh, uh, Deuteronomy, it says you shall not, in Leviticus, you shall not go up as a talebearer among the people. It was forbidden in the law to be a talebearer. Another, another word for talebearer is gossiper. You know, the Bible says that uh, there are si the six things the Lord hates and the seventh is an abomination. And guess what the seventh is? It's not uh, sexual immorality. The seventh is he that sows discord among brethren. Yes. The Bible calls gossip an abomination. Can you believe that? And yet many times we don't feel that we're doing anything wrong. We feel like, you know, I'm just, I can say what I want to say. No, you can't. Not if you're born again. And you know, the big thing is they say, well, I'm saying it because I don't want you hurt. Right. Like I've been hurt. Exactly. But it's not true, is it? No. <laughs> and I'm telling you this so you know how to pray. The, oh, the, oh, <laughs> no, that's one of the most dangerous. That has, that has gotten more people in the trouble than the man in the moon, you know. You know, we, we just need to pray about Sister Barbara because her children are just out of control. I saw one of them hanging from the chandelier, and, and I saw him over there at the store, and guess what he was buying? He was buying alcohol, and it just and now it's a whole soap opera yeah. that's yeah. supposed to be something we're, we're praying about. Um, I, I believe that if we would understand the heart of God and the power of our words, you know, uh, there's an analogy I give in the book where a woman goes to the priest and she says, you know, priest, I, I can't stop gossiping. I, I don't know how to stop it. What should I do? He says, okay, my daughter, let me tell you what to do. Go get the pillow from your house. She says, yes. <laughs> And she says, take it to the highest building you can find in your town. And I want you to cut it open and, and, and let the feathers fly out of it all over the city. And she does it. She goes and she goes to the building and she rips open the, the, cuts open the pillow and the feathers scatter everywhere. The wind takes the feathers as far as the eyes can see. 
Then she goes back to the priest and she says, you know, a priest, uh, I, I did what you said. He says, and what happened? She says, when I opened up the pillow, the feathers went everywhere. He says, now go back and get each feather and put it back in the pillow. She says, I can't. He said, that's gossip. Mm -hmm. And we don't understand that our words are powerful. They can affect the way we see things. They can affect the way people are treated. They can affect the way people are perceived. They can affect us. Yes. What we speak over ourselves affects us. And our children. And our children and the people in our lives. So my question that, that I have for people, are you blessing or are you cursing? Yes. Yeah. You're doing one or the other. You're doing one or the other. Yeah. 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 We're judging. Uh-oh. <laughs> Was that what we were going to say? Yeah. Uh -huh. Judging others, yeah. Yeah. Jesus said, judge not lest you be judged. For what measure you meet, it shall be measured unto you. Now, here's the thing, you know, there are two concepts for this. You know, people will often tell me, well, if you don't, if you don't uh, uh, judge the sin, you're just excusing the sin. No, no, there's oh. a difference. There's a difference. We are to distinguish right from wrong. That's one of the words for judging, to separate good from evil. We should know the difference between something that's good and something that's bad. That is the biblical judging. What we cannot do is condemn others for their sin, especially when we ourselves are guilty. Now you you know, gave an example of that in the book. Go ahead. And I'm glad you didn't mention names, so you go ahead and share that. Okay, so for example, when people fail in the church, you know, a lot of times we're quick to condemn them and say, you know, they're this, they're that, but we don't understand God's heart for restoration. God loved the world so much that he sent his son to die for a sinful race of people, the human race. And he sent his son to restore. The Bible says he did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but he sent his son so that the world might live through him. So that's always been God's heart for restoration. A lot of times when people fail, you know, uh, I tell a story of a leader who, who fell, a prominent leader. and. You know, many people were on the front lines burying this leader, talking about this leader. And one of the main people that was talking about the person had the same failure just a couple years later. And that's the insanity of judgment. We judge because we're guilty. You, and you reap what you sow. <laughs> and you're going to reap what you sow. Paul says in Romans chapter uh, 2, he says, oh, oh man that judges another and does the same thing. Don't you know that you are, you are impeding the mercy of God? Don't you know it's the m mercy and goodness of God that brings us to repentance? You know, we're the only community of people that kill our wounded. Yes. I've heard that. And, and one of the things that happens is the Lord gave me this example just today. He said many Christians are shooting themselves with guns that they have aimed at other people because we don't know how to apply the word so we try to use the word as a sword to cut someone else and end up decapitating ourselves. Yeah. And that's what happens. The Bible says that this word is a two-edged sword. It not only cuts, but it heals. Yes. It not only separates, but it restores. And I think if people understood the heart of God, it would be much more. The Bible says love is not easily offended, as you said uh, uh, earlier. Love seeks not, not her own. Love is not... Uh, uh, um, prideful. Love doesn't want others to fail. You know, I, there's this culture in our church today that is very disturbing. It's, it's almost as if we want people to fall. We want them to fail. And then we want to talk about them after yeah. they fail. But that's not what Jesus did. When Jesus caught the woman in adultery, he says, he that is without sin cast the first stone. Now, here's my question. Nobody wants to ask, where was the man? Yeah. <laughs> Where was the man? Yeah. They brought the woman out, but where was the man? Yeah. It was quite possible that he was holding a stone in his hand <laughs> because if they killed her, it would get him off the hook. And see, we don't think about that. And Jesus says, where are your condemners? And she says, well, they're all gone. He says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So I think we need to understand there's a difference between us judging right and wrong and condemning people yeah. because that's not the will of God. No. Yeah. You know, you said there were three steps to breaking the spirit of offense. Yeah. 
Could you talk about those three steps? If I can remember them, I know. Offend, uh, I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, forgiveness, repentance, and avoid it. Yeah. So the first thing we have to do is to forgive. Remember, we talked about uh, offense. It's like uh, um, this slime that the enemy wants on you. He wants you stuck. He wants you bitter, and he wants you broken. In other words, he doesn't want you to be able to move forward. And the first way we break the power of offense is by forgiveness. To forgive is to release. To forgive is to let go. Uh, when God, we, can I just say yes. this? Yes. You told me God just, you had like a vision of Jesus putting his hand on your yes. heart. Because you needed God to yes. come on the scene and help you. That's forgive. right. You know, it's difficult. Not I, just from the head. Exactly. I went through that as a leader. You know, people don't think that leaders can be offended. Leaders are some of the most offended people. Yes, they are. And, and they're some of the most hurt people. And uh, I was going through that even as a pastor because I had been deeply betrayed, deeply wounded, people walking out. You, you guys don't know anything about that. But <laughs> people walking out and leaving that said they would never leave. I'll be with you to the end of the age. And they left. And I was hurt. And one night I was in my bed and I had what it could have been a vision. I don't know what it was. But in this, this experience, the Lord just walked into the room and he laid his hand on my heart. And it's as if he removed the heart of stone. And he gave me a new heart. And I felt a lightness, you know. I, I felt a heaviness come off of me. I was able to have a renewed zeal for ministry. I didn't go to church and say, oh, here I go again to these mean sheep, and, you know. I'm, but it was, it was a different perspective, a love for his people. Only God can do that. <laughs> so I encourage people to ask the Lord, Lord, give me the grace to forgive. The second thing you have to do is you have to repent. In other words, you have to change your mind. You have to change the way you see things, uh, renew your mind, and then you have to avoid. The Bible says in, in Romans 16, mark those which cause offense and avoid them. You know, certain things you have to make up in your mind. You know what? I'm not going there. Right. I'm not going there. And I encourage people to know that you can be unoffendable, but it's a decision daily. When you walk out of your house, you know what? I will not be offended today. Amen. I will not allow the enemy to take me there. My destiny is too important. My purpose is too important. And the blessing of God is too great for me to be trapped in a prison of offense. And so it's a That's daily good. decision. Yeah. You know, decision. we've learned in recent days to ask God before we leave the house, we want your grace today. That's right. We want your grace and we accept it today. That's right. That's we right. accept it now. We thank and him and we receive it. That's right. And actually the reason we do that is because we had a friend that had an encounter, a heavenly yeah. encounter, and the Lord and the Father said, That's how my son made it through every day. Mm. Okay. Great grace. Ask wow. me daily, before you get out of bed, ask me for great grace and then thank me and receive it. So we do that. We try to every morning. We did this morning because we don't know what the day is going to hold. That's right. But, That's right. Uh, we just have a few minutes here, but uh, you've got a chapter. It's interesting. Uh, beware of Balaam and Absalom. Yeah. Well, let me just say it very quickly. What's happening in today's church is that there are people in the church cursing the church. And let me explain how that works. Balaam was a prophet. He was a backslidden prophet. And the king Balak, who was one of the enemies of the Israelites, tried to hire Balaam to curse the Israelites, to speak a curse over them. And in many ways, the enemy does the same. He uses those of us who are wounded and hurt to release a curse over the church. Now, when I say curse, a lot of people say, well, what do you mean curse? You know, I'm not sitting there with a, uh, a broomstick and a, a cauldron and, and, and putting frogs and stuff inside of it. No, a curse is when you speak an imprecation of evil. It could be as simple as how many people have left a church and because they were hurt, they wanted the church to fail or they wanted to pass. That's a curse. When you say, I hope, I hope they get what's coming to them. Uh, I, I hope they pay for what they've done. That's called a curse. And the Bible says, do not curse. Jesus didn't curse his enemies. Even when he was on the cross, he says, Lord, forgive them for they yes. know not what they do. He blessed them even in the midst of their sin. And so we have to be instruments of blessing, have to use our tongue to bless. If you've been hurt, say, you know what, Father, I, I know I've been hurt, but Lord, 
I just bless them. I, I, I just bless them, help them, deliver them, strengthen them. If they need to see something, show it to them, whatever it is. But Lord, I bless them and I release them. We have to do that. Yeah. You Amen. know, I once heard John Kilpatrick say yes. this in a church. He said, he was talking to the congregation and he said, quit cursing. And I'm not talking about cussing. Right. Quit cursing. <laughs> There's a difference. You're a yeah. pastor. That's he right. said, it's a wonder some pastors can even operate, that That's can right. even function, because those words never die. I mean, he said they're embedded in the church walls, and they're out there. That's right. So once you release those words, they're out there. Yep. So, but boy, if we bless them, if we pray for them. If we pray. I can yeah. It does the same thing. That's those right. blessings are still out there. That's right. That's right. They're in the walls. That's right. Amen. And they're in the atmosphere. That's Very right. Very powerful. Yeah. Well, we're going to take a break again. Okay. And when we come back, we're going to talk about how you can get this book and you can become an uncurser. You can become a blesser. That's right. Yeah. And that's how you become Amen. an uncurser. <laughs> you become a blesser. And right after Canaan's voice sings for us.
the accuser. Now this is what we're really going to focus on in this last few minutes. Unmasking the accuser. Mm. Now who is the accuser? You know who the accuser is. It's not your brother or not your mother. It's the devil. Mm. And you got, we're going to unmask him now. And you will find freedom you never thought possible mm. when you unmask the devil. Amen, King. Amen. Amen, amen. You know, I see this as one of, and, and I really want the people watching today to get this. This is one of the biggest conspiracies, one of the biggest, most heinous crimes in all of humanity. It started in the Garden of Eden with Eve. She was yeah. lied to, she was deceived, and it ushered in the curse. But I have good news for us. That same lie that came in through the garden to that woman where the enemy whispered into her ear and brought the curse on humanity. That lie was undone 2,000 years ago, where the angel came in the chamber of Mary and said, your son, this that is born of you will be the son of God, mm -hmm. and he will bruise the head of the accuser. And I want people to understand that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He's the one. He's been hiding in plain sight. He's been hiding behind our pain, our bitterness, our offense. He's been hiding behind gossip. And it's time to rip the mask off of him, to expose him for who he is. And people should know it wasn't my pastor. It wasn't my mother. It wasn't my father. It was the accuser of the brethren. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. It's not about people. It's a, there's a spiritual realm behind this reality that controls a lot of what we see and hear. And when people understand it, when they get this revelation, I believe the veil is gonna be moved by, and you, people are gonna see it's you. It's been you the whole time, dancing behind this curtain, you know? It's and true. you were the one that wanted me to hate my pastor, wanted me to hate my boss, wanted me to hate my ex-husband. It's been you that's been perpetuating lies. And once people expose him, for who he is, a liar and a thief. Yeah. He's lied to us, he's stolen from us. John 10, 10. That's right, John, the thief comes not before to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus has come that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And it's time for us to take back our destiny, to take back our peace, to take back our joy. There's some pastors watching right now. I don't know which where I can look, but there's some pastors watching right now and you are literally in a, a, a debilitated state because you've been so wounded and so broken, God wants to heal you today. There's a person watching, you are a minister, you are a singer, you are a dancer, a worshiper, and the enemy has literally crippled you with his lies. It's time for you to be set free. There's a mother, a brother, a sister, a daughter. Now is your time to be free in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. You can be free. Yes. And wouldn't it be wonderful if 
all the pastors in your community were free. That's right. Yeah. Wow. Would they preach good? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> they would be good. They wouldn't preach mad anymore. That's <laughs> right. No, that's true. And they do. <laughs> they do. <laughs> they do preach mad sometimes. You know, I'll... I guarantee you there's somebody out there watching. We've got three minutes, and they don't even know Jesus. They don't know how to do this. It really starts with That's being right. a part of the kingdom of God. Yeah, can I, can I pray with them, yes. please? You know, you're watching me today, and you're saying, you know what, I don't know this, this Jesus you're talking about, but I know I'm hurt, and I know I'm mad, and I know I was wounded, I know I was disappointed, I know I felt rejected. But let me tell you what the solution is. Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And I want to pray with you right now. Just begin to release your faith. Father, I thank you for every person thank watching. You. There's no coincidence. There's no mistake, no accident. This is a sovereign design of God that you would hear this message. And I, I declare, Lord, that those watching would open up their hearts to you. Just say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of all iniquities, unrighteousness. I put my faith and trust in you. I know you died for me and you were raised from the dead. I receive you as the Son of God, my Savior, my Deliverer, and my Lord. And I want you right now to just say, you know what? I forgive. I forgive. I don't know how to, but Holy Spirit, fill me up now with your love and your truth. Right now, I forgive in Jesus' name. Thank Amen. you, Father. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Oh, how wonderful Hallelujah. He is. And don't forget, first hundred of you. I don't care who you are, <laughs> you'll get the book. So just write to us, and if you're 101, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. <laughs> you won't get it. <laughs> but we want everyone to be blessed, and we want you to tell the accuser where to go, where he's from. Mm. And you know where that is. And you tell him to go right now. You're not going to accuse anymore. You're not going to backbite anymore. You're not going to complain and criticize yes. anymore. Can you imagine what a preacher would feel like if nobody criticized, backbit, anything? How would you preach? Oh, man, I've been preaching pretty good, but that, I'd be even better after that. <laughs> Amen. We're going to close with Canaan's voice singing, Jesus never fails, That's not sometimes. Truth. Absolute truth. <laughs> he never fails. Never fails. That's right. Bye, everyone. souls have tested him throughout the course of time so many still reach out to him with broken hearts and minds every one of them will say with no exception that they find Jesus never fails days of old he brought his people through and then he came to show his love and died for me and you then he rose again to prove that every story has been true Jesus never fails she Never fails, Jesus never fails. You might as well get thee behind me, Satan. You cannot prevail because Jesus never Sometimes
times this world brings trouble I find so hard to bear I know I could not make it without Jesus being there You're so encouraging to know However deep we're in deep 